you know, the, the mystery is something somehow got inside your head that didn't come through the senses or the ordinary senses and transcends t- time and space in some strange way. That's the mystery. Mm-hmm. That mystery is a mystery about physics. It's not about psychology. It's not about biology, neuroscience, and so on. So up until about 20 years ago when Aspect ran this experiment on non-locality, uh, it was conceivable from a quantum theoretic point of view that, um, that at some deep level that things are connected in the ways that Einstein called spooky action at a distance. But it wasn't until the experimental verification of it, and also, in, in fact, in, when Bell's theorem showed that uh, non-locality was a property that didn't even require quantum mechanics, um, that suddenly the, the physics of this became plausible. Mm-hmm. You know, we, we mm-hmm. often think that neuroscientists and many scientists, even a lot of physicists, believe that classical physics ideas are sufficient to explain how it is that we are aware. In other words, consciousness is identical to brain structure or brain processing. Mm-hmm. And brain processing can be completely and adequately described by classical physics in a purely reductionistic point of view and without recourse to anything strange like quantum mechanics. Well, of course, a minority of physicists and a minority of neuroscientists dispute that idea and are beginning to see that uh, that quantum views of matter and energy may in fact be necessary mm. to describe why something like consciousness or specifically conscious awareness uh, is is with us. But nevertheless, that's still a minority opinion. But so what? Mm-hmm. Size minority opinion as well. Mm-hmm. If you look at the, the, the vector of history on this, I think what what is happening, and this again has to do with this idea of the compass pointing is, is slowing down and beginning to point in one particular direction. I think the direction that is pointing is that our previous notions about what we meant by material and by physical are significantly changing. Mm. You know, the dualistic split requires that, uh, I mean, in Descartes' day, that there was mind stuff and matter stuff, and they really did not interact. And that is a large reason why there's this... this um, People have been perplexed ever since then about how how could those two interact at all, and that in in a sense led to behaviorism and psychology, which is like the mainstream neuroscience point of view, where it's all it's an organic machine, mm-hmm. and, and the circuitry in the machine is causing this um, this awareness. Even though nobody can at this point explain how such a thing could be possible, There's right? And they all admit that hand waving and tap dancing about things like recursive circuitry, which mm-hmm. creates awareness. Mm. The thing is, I'm not so sure that that's wrong. Uh-huh. That, that may be right. It may be that awareness is an aspect of highly complicated systems, but I don't think it can be described in classical terms. And okay. it, I think it requires a deeper understanding of what we mean by matter. And at some point, the difference between mind and matter, the apparent separation, or even the apparent complementarity of the two, will be seen to be an illusion. And and what I mean by that is that at a deep enough state, if you go far enough into matter or far enough into mind, you end up at the same place. Mm. So the way I I think of it as a metaphor is you take a, a ribbon and you write mind on one side and matter on the other, and if you connect the ribbon in the usual way, then they are completely separate. You cannot get from one to the other, but you can show strong correlations. You know, if you shake the ribbon, the mind side will sort of wiggle, and the matter side will wiggle along right with it in one-to-one correspondence. And that, that's, where, that's what the neuroscience view says. That's the way it is. Mm-hmm. The brain wiggles and you think, and vice versa. Mm-hmm. I'm saying that... Well, uh, they don't say vice versa, right? I know they don't. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, or at least not the hard line. Yeah, uh, the hard line basically say it's all brain functioning and that that's all. That's the, the yeah. zombie model. Mm-hmm. Uh, the alternative is that um, by having a different concept of what we mean by matter, it's as though you took the ribbon and did a half twist and made it into a Mobius strip. Okay. In which case, the mind and the matter side are identical 
They just look different if you hold the strip at a distance and you can't see that it's a Mobius strip. But with a, a slight twist to your way of thinking about what are we even dealing with, you, you can make the two actually turn into one. Mm. And, and you can see that very clearly when you bring it up close and you, you kind of go along the strip and find out that there is no inside and no outside. But again, at a distance, which is what I think is going on with, uh, with classical neuroscience, they're looking at the problem metaphorically like a ribbon at a distance, and they can't see that it's a Mobius strip. Mm. So when you, when you say, you know, in this new way of thinking that they're identical, what does it mean to say that mind and matter are the same thing? What, how does that change our understanding of mind or matter? Well, they're not literally the same because the words mm. are pointing at, at different aspects mm -hmm. of it. Um, and I'm actually pretty comfortable with the idea that a complex system could give rise to levels of recursion that would create awareness mm -hmm. as we know it. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I'm, uh, and in that sense, I'm sort of a quasi-materialist in the mm -hmm. sense that I don't think that anything, any special substance is necessary to understand consciousness mm. in a larger sense. Mm -hmm. But rather that a new understanding of matter will allow it to, uh, not only to create awareness as we know it, but also sort of uh, naturally explains why people can be psychic and they also have mystical experiences. It creates a certain spectrum I mean, I think of this as uh, if classical physics were all there was, then this, there, you can imagine a spectrum of ways that mind can be, and it stops short just before, um, well, it actually, even further back, it stops short only at conscious awareness. There's not even any unconscious. But then you begin to think about it more, and there's, there's been advancements through Freud and so on. Um, and neuroscience, where we know that there's a huge unconscious processing going on, but it still sh stops short before psychic experience and way before mystical experience. Mm -hmm. And the reason it's stopping is, is largely due to uh, our, our ignorance at that point about what, do we th wh what is the ultimate nature or fabric of reality. And as that fabric has become richer and richer, mainly through developments in physics, um, I think that the spectrum begins to increase. It increases certainly into the psychic realm and probably into the mystical. You want to know why? Yeah. So do I. <laughs> <laughs> this is. Um, it, it, I'm working on this right now in the book, and I, I know it needs to be said, but I'm trying to find ways of saying it that are clear enough so that a, a non, a person who has not spent years reading hundreds of articles and books can, can grok it. Mm, good. I'm, I have not found a way yet to do that, uh -huh. uh, but that, that's why I'm working on it. But just I'm just going to try to, to, to talk it. Yeah, uh -huh. great. Let's go in there. So you're not talking about something like panpsychism or panexperientialism or anything no. like that? No. Okay. It, it's much more, it's more closely aligned to, the, to what people like uh, David Bohm and, and others since Bohm have tried to do in figuring out what the ontology is, uh, what's, what's our ontological reality given uh, not only quantum theory but the experimental verification of non-locality and entanglement, which are basically mm. the same thing. Mm -hmm. What does that mean in terms of the, the fabric of the, the world that we live in? And I think what it means, and in fact I've there are a number of books now where phys physicists who know what they're talking about, at least in terms of the mechanics of the theory, uh, they, they start pushing the ontology of non-locality further and further, and they all mm. reach the same conclusion that if, in fact, things are entangled, uh, if all it requires for something to become entangled is some contact at some point in its history, uh, then everything in our universe ought to be entangled because we presumably came from one dot, uh -huh. one big bang. Is, is that part of the, ph the physics of this, is that for two things to become entangled, they had to have contact? That's the... That is the way that's so currently described, but I think it, it's probably more than that. I think it, it's... I mean, you can do a double slit experiment and show that a photon is entangled with itself. 
well, you know, a thing and itself have always been in contact, mm-hmm. like in quotes. And so even a single particle mm. uh, is already entangled with itself. So if two particles interact in some way, then uh, then they become entangled as well. But ultimately, the universe has been around long enough that everything has been entangled with everything else. And this idea... Okay, yeah. 